Craig, the bank bill swap rates. Yeah, lots going on in the banking space at the moment. Let's get more. Joining us on the desk is Nathan Bell from Peters McGregor. And welcome to the show, Nathan. I guess Westpac's a huge story today, and the banks in general have been a huge story over the past few weeks. It looks like it could take a bit of a hit uh, at the open, giving, given a miss on a couple of metrics, particularly that net interest margin. Look, I think the longer term picture for the banks is, is anything going to happen in the housing market? I mean, that's the big thing everyone's looking at. The knock against Commonwealth Bank and Westpac Bank is that they're the most exposed to mortgages and by global standards uh, like people freak out overseas because they see how much exposure they've got but as long as the housing market remains strong and we've seen some sort of mortgage stress at the moment but it's off such a low base I think Westpac and Commonwealth will continue to do just well, fine. From a global global investment perspective which which you have I mean, how do the, the local banks rate as an investment opportunity at the moment? Yeah well the way I put it is it's the, probably the riskiest time in 30 years to own the Australian banks mm. and it's the least riskiest time uh, to own European banks in 15 years, like mm. just the dichotomy of where they are in the cycle is completely different. Because in terms of yield as well, you know, we're seeing that whole picture change globally. So you wonder whether or not they're even an attractive yield play anymore when interest mm. rates are going up around the world. I think what's less appreciated about the European banks is the balance sheets have mostly been cleaned up since the GFC, which should have happened four or five years ago, but we've mm. finally got there for most banks. But they're still paying a three to four percent dividend yield, so you're not actually having to completely give up your dividend yield like you do if you own the US banks, for example. Have prices run ahead in that European banking? Space? Space because certainly there's been a lot of talk about it. I would have thought a lot of the low-hanging fruit in terms of opportunity might have been taken. I think that's right, but there's other countries. I think Italy has really been a basket case for Aren't the last... consolidating as well? I mean, they're all over the place. They're being owned by governments. You're seeing consolidation within that space as well. Yeah, and there's been, uh, I mean, 20 billion euros of public taxpayer money has come into the Italian banking system. So you've got a couple of banks that are basically cherry-picking all the good loans with taxpayers' money um, and paying a 3 to 4% dividend yield with a uh, European Central Bank interest rate of negative 0.4%. Mm. <laughs> what, what about when it comes to US banks? Because we've just seen, obviously, mm. a lot of companies report. It, it's looking quite solid there in the US. Are yep. these ones you'd want to invest in going forward, given yeah. the, the interest rate cycle there as well? Uh, we own Wells Fargo, but uh, we sold our Bank of America shares a bit too early last year. But I think most of the news is incorporated into the share price or the valuations now. Mm. So I think Europe is a much more interesting place to be because you've got interest rates that still haven't moved up yet. What about the idea of, of looking, as we're seeing a lot of retail investors do, at an ETF that is able to, um, to capture a lot of those banks, be they in Europe or, or be they in the US? I mean, is that an opportunity as well, do you think? Yeah, I think it's not uh, the way we would invest. We'll go stock by stock. But mm. to someone who's looking to get overseas exposure cheaply and they do want to run with those themes, I think that could be quite sensible. Yeah. It's interesting people think of them as passive investments, but they actually can use them in a very active way. How, I mean, how much further upside in some of these European banks, let's take the Italian banks, which is mm. obviously an, in, uh, an area of interest for you at the moment, how much further do you think they've got to run? Yeah, so I mean, if I look at, say, ING Bank, which is a very solid bank, uh, if interest rates start going up, you know, maybe it goes up by 20 or 25 per cent. Mm. But some of these Italian banks, like, no one's really paying attention and all the bad debts are starting to get cleaned up. Hedge funds are coming in and start mm. buying up those bad loans. And there's a couple there that, uh, if things go right over the next two or three years, could double or more. Some of the risks going on in Europe, you know, such as, I guess, what we're seeing with Brexit and more mm. broadly, you know, we're seeing that sort of theme play out in a lot of areas in Europe. Are you seeing that impact the banking space or these sort of stocks in general? Look, I think it's actually far more positive in Europe than what actually people think it is when they haven't gone there. Every person I talk to that actually goes to Italy is seeing signs in the stores that we need help. We're looking mm. for people. Youth unemployment's come down from 50% in Italy down into the 30s. Uh, like that's real depression-like numbers. Um, so there's still a long way to go for these. So are banks where, where you should invest then in this sort of theme that we're seeing globally? I mean, do you see any other sort of stock sectors that, that might benefit from this? Yeah, I think the stuff that's really high quality that people really want to own, I think all that stuff's just trading up at nosebleed valuation. So the banks is sort of the last area that hasn't been fully cleaned up yet and it's been the last place for money to come to. Nosebleed valuations bring us nicely to tech stocks. <laughs> but let's, uh, let's not go to the US, let's talk China because we've spoken a few times about some of these, you know, behemoth tech stocks, your ten cents, your Alibabas and yep. so forth. Regulatory concerns, I've, a lot of people starting to talk about kicking in potentially for some of these big names out of China. You view, you view in that light of them? Yeah, so the first thing is the Chinese government wants their national champions, which is basically why these companies have next to no competition in the home mm. markets. So that's the good thing. The flip side is that we're actually starting to see now that the government wants to 
clamp down on what these companies are showing on their websites. So the internet sector is a very sensitive sector for China. And so we've actually got talk now of how uh, government officials can actually come into your boardroom and, and start uh, making decisions. So the question is, are they actually going to impact what investments these companies make on a large scale? Or is it really there just to censor some of what's going on on the websites? Do you think they'll start to move away from that, the Chinese government? I mean, there is talk that they're trying to become more Western in terms of mm -hmm. you know, the way they do business and trying to attract investment. I mean, they're going to have to sort of move away from that if they want to attract more global investment, right? Yeah, actually, it's quite the opposite now. They're actually clamping down. There's actually more going mm -hmm. on. And they've actually talked about taking special shares in the companies. And I think that was a good idea until they realised they'd have to pay about four billion US dollars for one percent of ten cent. Mm -hmm. To Ingrid's point, though, I mean, it'll be a concern if you're a, an outside investor yeah. looking at China and, and coming out of the national congress. You've got, you know, the, the president talking about, in fact, no, we're not going to start to champion private mm -hmm. business. We're going to continue to champion state-owned enterprises. Yeah, and I think that's the million-dollar question at the moment: is what is actually the impact they're trying to have? And the first thing we've seen is actually these companies are having to be forced mm. to invest in things that they otherwise wouldn't be. So like a government telco, for example, mm. so far the numbers are small, but if the numbers start getting bigger, then we've got something to so worry how about. How do you invest in it? How do you take the, the assurance, the confidence, uh, and, and put, put money into some of these companies? Yeah, for us, valuation is everything. It's like a low valuation is going to protect you against a myriad of risks. Mm. Uh, Baidu is the Google of China. We were able mm. to buy that a year ago at 12 times free cash flow versus more than double that mm. for Google in the US. Uh, simply there was a regulatory clampdown, uh, but it was a story about a young kid who died after getting bad advice on a website which really had not a lot to do with the company. It was more the healthcare system in China. So even in the technology sector, you still get these value plays every now and then if you've got your ear to the ground. Do you have, uh, so, see sort of any impact from uh, the US President Donald Trump um, and his sort of tax reform and these mm. sort of issues? Because he's obviously in Asia this week uh, visiting, you know, Chinese President and, and obviously talking about a lot of these things with free trade coming up, also the TPP in focus on the weekend uh, with our Prime Minister talking about that. Do you see any of this impacting the way that the Chinese government gets involved or the way these stocks are, how attractive these stocks are? I, I don't think that particular issue and I don't think Trump's going to have much impact on the Chinese technology stocks. The fact is when you're paying a big multiple for, for a stock, you don't actually need a lot to go wrong for that multiple to shrink. So Tencent, which has got 963 million users on its free messenger uh, mobile service, but makes about 70% of its income from gaming. Mm. Um, so this is young kids um, who have actually been have told that they can't to spend as much time online uh, anymore as a dictate by the government to clamp down on the hours. So it shows you how addictive these gaming is and mm. hugely profitable. Got to get your thoughts while we're talking tech stocks about the US, of course. Apple reaching an all-time high. It's up some 50% this year alone. <laughs> Amazon's trading around about $1,100 at the moment. Not just through Alphabet, Microsoft, all trading around all-time highs. Your thoughts on, on the valuations and the... Both. People are willing to pay up because they want growth. Yep, so a giant thorn in our performance numbers for a long time now, so we really missed the boat on those. <laughs> uh, so I'm glad we've got our Chinese technology stocks. Uh, but they just keep going from strength to strength, and I think that's the difference between looking at 1999, for example. Yes, valuations might be high, but we've got massive, very fast-growing cash flows in these businesses. And last week that's right. was just a huge year. Google, which should be a mature business by now, and everyone was worried about the switch to mobile, uh, grew revenues or profits at like 33 per cent. Um, these are 400, 500 billion dollars businesses mm. um, growing at 30 and 40 per cent. Uh, this is a new world for, for investors. Yeah, very exciting. Nathan Bell, great to talk as always. Thank you. Thanks. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, Mark Bailey from Fixed Securities for the latest in bond market movements. Right.